We would like to welcome you to our series, Raising the Bar, a closer look at our focus area on mental health. Our presenters today are Claire Watton, Mary Ellen Landry, and Chris Friesen. Our first presenter will be Claire Watton. Claire joined the Learning Bar as a research assistant in May 2014. She completed both an Honours Bachelor of Arts Contemporary Studies from Wilfrid Laurier University and a Bachelor of Education from Nipissing University in 2012. Most recently, Claire completed a Master of Arts in Sociology from the University of Guelph, during which she wrote a thesis exploring the relationship between school engagement and mental health amongst adolescents. She's passionate about the well-being of children and youth as it relates to the school context and is excited to be a part of the Learning Bar team. Thank you, Mary Ellen. As Mary Ellen said, my name is Claire Watton and I'm a research assistant here at the Learning Bar. I'm excited to be able to engage in a conversation of child and youth mental health with my colleagues, our guest speaker Chris Friesen, and our many wonderful members who are tuning in. So I'm going to just take a moment to give you an overview of what I'll be discussing throughout the research component of this webinar. Now essentially what I'm going to do is establish the climate of child and youth mental health in Canada today. So defining some of the key terms, summarizing the statistics, and based on that context, talk about the importance of and best practices in school-based mental health programs. I'll then provide an overview of how you can use our Tell Them From Me surveys to help establish the climate of mental health in your specific school or district so that then you will know what type of school-based mental health program will be most effective in your school. So overall, the goal is to generate a sense of or refresh your knowledge of the key research findings in child and youth mental health in Canada and to have you start to think of the ways in which you can use Tell Them From Me survey tools to gather information about the mental health of your students. So I'll start by defining some of the key terms that we find in the literature and in general conversation on this topic. Now, according to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, mental health is generally conceived as the state an individual is in, in which everything seems to be working well. So generally feeling good about yourself, having healthy, positive relationships with others, being able to function well within your everyday tasks, and being able to respond and adapt to the many challenges or changes that arise in everyday life. Now, we often hear different terms used to describe the opposite of mental health. On the one hand, we have mental health problems or mental health issues. And this encompasses changes in thinking, mood, and behavior that negatively impact an individual's normal day-to-day -day functioning. So if we think about this in the context of children and youth, this could mean difficulties functioning in their relationships with peers or their families, difficulty functioning in the various sports or activities that they take part in, and of course, their ability to function both socially and academically in the school environment. Now, the other term that is used to describe the opposite of mental health is mental illness. And mental illnesses are those mental health problems or issues described before that severely impact an individual's ability to function, but that have a particular set of symptoms and have been formally diagnosed by a mental health professional. So some examples include depression, schizophrenia, and eating disorders. So with that terminology in mind, now we'll turn to a discussion of some of the key statistics on child and youth mental health in Canada. Now, according to the Canadian Mental Health Association, at any given point in time, roughly 10 to 20% of Canadian youth are affected by mental illness. And this is the highest percentage among all of the age groups. Now, there are some specific mental illnesses that are more common among children and youth than others. And it's important to note here that when I use the term child and youth, it generally refers to the age range of late childhood into the adolescent range up to about 18 years of age. So I'll briefly describe what some of these more common mental illnesses are among children and youth. So first we have anxiety disorders, and this affects roughly 6.5% of all Canadian children and youth. Now, those with anxiety disorders experience excessive and unrealistic feelings of anxiety, fear, or worry, which causes them to either avoid the situations that tend to bring about those feelings, or develop compulsive rituals in order to help lessen the feelings of fear and anxiety. Now, of course, there are different types of anxiety disorders, and some of those include generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, social anxiety disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. 
Another mental illness common to the period of childhood and adolescence is depression or major depressive disorder, which affects roughly 5% of males and 12% of females. Now, depression is a mood disorder that is characterized by feelings of intense despair, sadness, and worthlessness over an extended period of time, which is typically at least two weeks. Another common mental illness is conduct disorder, which affects roughly 4% of children and youth. Now in brief, conduct disorder involves a sustained state of aggression to the point where it becomes very problematic for the individual and those surrounding the individual. So those with conduct disorder often make threats to or actually harm other people, animals or objects, and often have trouble understanding how other people think and how to effectively communicate with their feeling, which is particularly problematic and frustrating for the individual. Eating disorders are another common type of mental illness among children and youth. And they involve a distorted perception of one's body image coupled with harmful behaviors to manage food and weight. We generally see eating disorders broken down into anorexia, which involves the restriction of food and affects roughly 1% of Canadian children and youth, and bulimia, which involves uncontrollable binge eating followed by purging, and that affects roughly 3% of children and youth. Schizophrenia is also among the mental illnesses common to Canadian children and youth. Affecting roughly 1% of the population, schizophrenia involves periods of time called episodes in which one can experience an inability to cipher between what is reality and what isn't, otherwise known as psychosis, which can involve seeing, smelling, hearing, and feeling things that are not there. These episodes can also involve the inability to think and communicate clearly, and often left untreated, the individual has a very difficult time functioning in their day-to-day -day activities. So there are, of course, many different mental illnesses that Canadian children and youth experience, but here I've outlined some of the mental illnesses that the students in your school or district are more likely to experience than others. Now, what is particularly troubling is that in Canada, only one out of every five children and youth who require mental health services will actually receive them. In light of this, there has been an increased interest in recent years into school-based mental health programs. So when we are talking about school-based mental health programs, we're talking about those programs implemented at the school level that are aimed at one or more of preventing mental health problems, intervening when mental health problems are occurring, and promoting positive mental health. School-based mental health programs have such great potential, and I'll outline some of the reasons why. So first, children and youth spend a substantial amount of time within the school setting. So this makes access, both accessing children and youth at risk for, or that are experiencing mental health problems, and then the students having access to mental health services, much easier. Further, applying existing school structures and practices, for example, mandatory attendance and homework completion, to mental health service delivery helps to eliminate the issue of discontinuation of treatment because students have some external motivators to participate and stay engaged in the program. Another benefit of implementing mental health programs in the school environment is that through class-wide instruction and activities, high-risk students can benefit from observing how their peers behave in certain situations, respond to challenges and manage their emotions, so the skills are being modeled for them among their peers. And finally, school-based mental health programs help maximize the positive mental health development for all children, not just those who are at risk for or already experiencing mental health issues. Now, thinking of the ways in which you can implement a mental health program at your school can seem particularly overwhelming at the outset, just knowing where to begin and what type of model to follow. But thankfully, the Mental Health Commission of Canada issued a report September of 2013 which is readily available online and contains a summary of school-based mental health programs in Canada. So in particular, this report summarizes what school-based mental health programs tend to look like in Canada, but more specifically, what the strengths and weaknesses are of different models and what the best practices are. So there are two particularly useful findings from this report. The first one is that universal programs are most effective. So when the program is implemented at the school-wide, grade-wide, or class-wide level, 
And some of the reasons why these types of programs are most effective are that in using this model, where participation is open to all students in a particular school, grade, or class, no individual students are singled out or pinpointed as being particularly vulnerable, and it helps to reduce the stigma associated with seeking mental health services. It's also particularly helpful for teachers and school administrators to be able to integrate the program into their existing school day and possibly as part of regular classroom activities. The other key finding from this report is that the most effective school-based mental health programs focus on social skills training or social emotional learning. And this is where students are taught about or given opportunities to practice and discuss effective coping skills, conflict resolution and appreciating perspectives of others, stress management skills, learning how to set and make a plan to achieve goals, and how to be more self-aware among many others. So these are sort of the best practices outlined by the Mental Health Commission of Canada. But in order to determine how to specifically structure the school-based mental health program at your school or among the schools in your district, it's important to have a sense of the types of issues students tend to be facing and what the general climate of mental health looks like in your school or district. So with that said, our TTFM surveys can serve as a useful tool to help you gather information about the mental health of your students. Now, the purpose here is not to be diagnostic, and identify mental illness among the students in your school or district, but rather to be able to establish what the trends are or the key problem areas among your student body as a whole. So with that said, what I'm going to do now is take a moment to discuss some of our survey measures and what information they can provide you about the mental health of your students. So first we have our emotional health indicator and it's made up of three measures, depression, anxiety, and self-esteem. In terms of depression, we ask students six survey questions in which we have them think about the extent to which they experience feelings or display symptoms of sadness, discouragement, and inadequacy. Some examples of those survey items include, I feel lonely, or I cry without a good reason. And these are statements in which students indicate how much they agree or disagree. In terms of anxiety, this measure is made up of six items as well. Here, we ask students to indicate the extent to which they experience feelings or display symptoms of excessive fear or worry. Some examples of those survey items include, I am too fearful or nervous, and I worry more than most kids. Finally, our third measure of emotional health is self-esteem, which is made up of seven items asking students to reflect on their view of themselves and their abilities and their sense of self-worth. Some examples of these survey items include, in general, I like the way I am, and when I do something, I do it well. Now, while we do offer this explicit indicator of emotional health, it is important to understand the ways in which many of our other Tell Them From Me survey measures can inform you more indirectly about the mental health of your students as well. So I'll use the example of our student engagement indicator. Here at the Learning Bar, we define student engagement as a disposition towards learning, working with others, and functioning in a social institution. And so that includes a student's sense of belonging at school, the extent to which they value schooling outcomes, and their psychological investment in the learning process. Now, as you can see, our student engagement construct is made up of three different measures that target three different dimensions of student engagement. Social engagement, intellectual engagement, and institutional engagement. Now, as previously discussed, mental health issues can impede on a student's ability to function both socially and academically in the school environment. Therefore, we might expect that a student suffering from mental illness would be experiencing any one or more of decreased social engagement, intellectual engagement, and institutional engagement. Further, research has shown that students who are disengaged are more likely than those who are engaged to engage in delinquent behavior, abuse drugs, drop out of school, and experience depression or decreased life satisfaction. So while school engagement is not a direct measure of mental health, you can use the data on your students' levels of engagement to assess the likelihood that they will experience or are already experiencing mental health issues. To further emphasize the link between student engagement and mental health, 
Dr. Wilms, president and CEO of The Learning Bar, found through cluster analysis that students who have the highest probability of completing school are both engaged and have positive mental health. So they are not experiencing depression or anxiety and have high levels of self-esteem. What this tells us is that those who are highly engaged in school tend to have positive mental health. So again, we can use our data on student engagement levels to assess the climate of mental health among students in a particular school or district. You can see this classification of the different types of students based on their levels of engagement and mental health outcomes by using our school completion survey. Several of our other measures can tell us indirectly about student mental health in the same way that student engagement can. Some of these measures include, but are not limited to, bully victimization. So several studies have shown that those who have been victims of bullying are at an increased risk of experiencing mental health problems. On our Tell Them From Me surveys at both the elementary and secondary level, we ask students if they have ever experienced any one or more of physical, verbal, social, or cyberbullying. So if you find that there is a high level of bully victimization in your school or district, chances are that there are students experiencing mental health issues. You can also use information about students' drug use and whether or not students have someone at home they can turn to for encouragement and advice to assess your student's risk of experiencing mental health issues. So in summary, our TTFM surveys contain both direct measures of mental health, which include our depression, anxiety, and self-esteem measures, as well as indirect measures, including but not limited to student engagement, bully victimization, drug use, and advocacy at home. This data can be used to help identify the degree of mental health issues among the students in your school and what types of problems they tend to be facing. It's important to remember here that our surveys are not used to diagnose mental illness. And ultimately, the information gathered using our tools can help inform you how to best structure your school-based mental health program. I now turn the discussion over to Mary Ellen Landry, who will go into more detail about how you can use the Tell Them From Me tools to gather information about student mental health. This concludes our first segment. Thank you, Claire. Now that we've set the scene with the background in the literature and research, let's take a look at the Tell Them From Me reporting tools. Here, I'll be sharing how you can utilize the different reports to look at some of the measures used in mental health for a practical application, finding the story in your data, if you will. Let's start by taking a look at what measures you might want to include for data collection and then have to explore in the area of mental health. The three measures that directly relate to mental health are shown here, anxiety, depression, and self-esteem. We can see the measure description and the number of questions available for these measures here. This information can also be found in the interactive charts by flipping your chart using the question mark or hovering over the measure in the Measure Summary selection page. For the secondary school survey, all three measures are available, with the measure of anxiety available for the elementary school survey. Let's start by taking a look at what measures you might want to explore. The three measures that directly relate to mental health are shown here, with the other measures selected that also feed into those measures, like sense of belonging, positive relationships, truancy, tobacco, alcohol, and gambling, bullying exclusion and harassment, safety at school, and aspirations to finish high school. You can access your reports from the Tell Them From Me homepage from two different ports. You can see here from Monitor Progress or from the View Reports. Clicking on one of the options just shown will take you to your own dashboard that will show you what reports are generally available. Please note that not all reports may be available to you. It depends on a few different factors, including the measures chosen by your jurisdiction, whether there were any open-ended questions for the survey takers to answer, and the size of the reporting population. Each one of the tools you see here can be valuable in exploring your data. Let's take a look. Using the Tell Them For Me one-click report, you can see a summary of all your survey results and get a good feel as to how your district or school did on certain measures overall. So, the one-click report is a good tool to start your data exploration using measures that relate to mental health, for example. As a reminder, the one-click report shows all survey results by measure. Using the example provided here, 
I can quickly see that my students in grades 9 to 12 are above the Canadian norm in regards to anxiety. The Canadian norm should be used as a benchmark and is not something I should necessarily be striving for or be okay with, but it does suggest where the school sits with other Canadian schools and provide a reference point. The text on the left of the chart suggests that both my boys and girls have a higher level of anxiety compared to the Canadian average. By making this observation, I know that this is something I may need to focus on in terms of mental health and how I might look at this result and others when I dig deeper in the interactive charts. From your view reports dashboard, when you click on the interactive charts link, report available, you'll be taken to the measure summary page where you can select the measures that are of interest to you. I have chosen to look specifically at anxiety as it stood out in the one-click report. Once I select the measure as seen here, I will click Submit and my interactive chart will populate. Now that I've identified using the one-click report that further investigation is needed under the anxiety measure, I can use the powerful and dynamic interactive chart tool to provide more information using drill downs. Once your student surveys have closed and reports are available, measures that relate to mental health are reported in their own individual charts within the dynamic interactive chart tool. This allows you to dissect the factors affecting mental health at more of a micro level. On this slide, I have used anxiety once again as an example. Here, I drilled the measure down by sex and grade, and as such, it allows me to see and look deeper into what might be going on behind this measure and to give further context and understanding of the data as it was reported by the students. So in this case, the drill downs allow you the ability to uncover what might be going on with a subpopulation of students and allow you to target interventions accordingly. Remember, the data is not the answer, but more so information to have meaningful discussions with your school teams and we'd like to offer with the students themselves. Please keep in mind that any data you may see on these slides comes from our demo district, so it's not any particular school or district's data. In regards to all our measures, not just the measures of mental health, the key is to regularly survey your students in order to gain insight into which areas you should be celebrating, as well as identifying the areas in which you need to adjust. A suggestion to maximize success would be to adopt the notion of completing two snapshots within a school year. That is to say you can survey your students in the fall, analyze your data and apply the results to your school improvement planning, and in this case, any interventions related to mental health and early in the school year that might be able to make an impact in a positive way. Then, in the spring, survey your students again using a subset of identified measures to see which interventions were successful and which areas still need work. Mental health is an area that may or may not need a longer time frame to see growth. You can apply our year-over-year -year comparison to this measure, a function you can perform in our interactive charts once there is at least one years of data. You can compare up to three years worth of data so long as you continually choose to survey on the same measures. By applying this comparison, you can see how your school has improved over several years, which is terrific for long-term improvement planning. These are just a few examples of how you can use the Tell Them For Me reporting tools to track your school's mental health levels. We do encourage you to utilize our report so you can too see the story your students are trying to tell you. Further to this, the Account Success Management team at the Learning Bar does offer debriefing sessions, which provides more detailed support in examining your data. If this is a service you're interested in, please connect with your Account Success Manager. Finally, I would like to offer that the scrapbook tool within Tell Them For Me can provide you with an easy to use framework for sharing data and creating powerful presentations. Within the Tell Them For Me environment, it is the feedback loops, communication to your stakeholders, and using the data for discussion that can maximize the overall power and perception of the tool as not just another survey, but a tool for change, student voice, and a part of planning that students, teachers, and parents can learn to appreciate. So a few quick nuggets on Scrapbook would be that it can be personalized, download to a PDF, zip, or PowerPoint for quick and easy sharing and presenting. And when working with the interactive charts, you can click on the camera icon to collect charts that are of interest to you. 
While in the interactive chart, clicking on the question mark reveals information behind the measure and can also be included in your downloads to provide the audience with more texture and a behind the scenes information on a particular measure. This and other tools and supports are available to all Tell Them For Me members and we look forward to working and sharing this with you. Now we'll hear from Chris Friesen, principal at Woodstock Collegiate Institute, home of the Red Devils, with the Thames Valley District School Board in London, Ontario. Chris and his wife Jackie have lived in Woodstock, Ontario for the past 25 years. They have five children and three grandchildren. Chris has been an administrator for 15 years and an educator for 25 years. Almost all of his experience has been at the secondary level, but he has been an administrator in elementary, adult and continuing education. Currently, he is the principal at Woodstock Collegiate Institute in Woodstock, Ontario. WCI is one of three public high schools in Woodstock and has a population of about 600 students. To quote from their website, each student every day. This is an initiative at the school with a commitment to get to know each and every one of their students so they will know what each of them need to be a better person when they graduate. This could be growth in academics, social, emotional, or physical well-being. I will now hand things over to Chris. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for that introduction. I am pleased to have the opportunity to share with everyone who's listening about the work that Woodstock Collegiate has done in conjunction with the Tell Them For Me survey, and in particular, uh, how we have found that it has benefited our efforts on uh, our, helping our students deal with mental health issues. So a little bit of an introduction. Uh, between uh, the partnership between our school and the Tell Them For Me survey. Beginning in the fall of 2011, our school began to focus primarily and almost exclusively on student engagement. Uh, and our purpose was to systematically get to know each student as deeply as possible. And, and just to clarify, I'm sure every school out there would say that they all attempt to get to know their students as deeply as possible. But from having been in, in many schools now, uh, now into my 25th year as a this is the first time I've been in a school where our primary goal, why we do what we do, is first and foremost based on how do we get to know students better. And I can tell you that now more than three years into that, it is different, like anything else is different, when you decide to focus on one thing and make that your, your priority and, and, uh, and what it is that, that drives the work you do. So. We, we started working through this in the fall of 2011, and I quickly realized uh, staff were on board. They, they saw the value of getting to know students better because it just made sense to them. It was a, a goal that spoke to them, spoke to why I think they became teachers in the first place. But it left us with a bit of a, a problem in terms of how do we measure? How do we know if we're actually making progress with getting to know students better? How do we know if we're engaging them better? How do we know if they feel more secure, that they belong? Uh, that they feel like that we're trying to get to know them better. So I, I did my research and I, and I landed on the Tell Them For Me survey. And uh, it didn't take long uh, when we started looking at the survey that we realized this would be a good fit for, for where we're trying to go because it would provide us that tangible measure um, that uh, is almost demanded these days to be able to analyze data and report back to your teachers, your students, your parents, your superintendent, your, your board, to say that you know we are making a difference and not just because your gut tells you so um, but because you have real data to point to so we first used the survey in the spring of 2012 and we've been using it each spring uh, for the last three years we've we've purposely chosen just to do the survey once a year so it's always fresh for our students and 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 i see that if that works i'm usually in the room when the students are doing the survey and i can tell that they're engaged in the process uh, they don't see it as a big deal to do the survey it takes them 15 20 minutes and uh, it's not a task they dread. And I think they, they enjoy the fact that we're asking them for their opinion. In terms of mental health, I'll admit that when we started doing this work, as I said previously, our focus was primarily on how do we get to know students better. It wasn't because we were focused solely on their mental health. Um, and in fact, I don't think we even talked about, uh, well, this will improve their mental health, it'll improve our ability to help them with their mental health. It became a byproduct, uh, unintended, but certainly very welcome byproduct of, of the work we're doing. And I think it's one of the things we can point to as a success uh, that we have seen improvements in our students' mental health. So I'll cover five points um, that I think show 
uh, how there has been a relationship between our work uh, to get to know students better, the survey, and the mental health of our students. And the five are the survey itself. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about how we just use the survey as a vehicle uh, to help with mental health. Um, we established a grade 10 counselor position based on it. Uh, we've changed uh, how we do our day with uh, our breaks between classes. We've initiated a, a, an exciting, slightly innovative program called Catch Up Days. And our very innovative and unique leadership program um, has done some work recently with our grade nine girl population, specific, specifically about mental health. So I'll start with um, what's most important to our school, and that's our school goal. And our school goal is very simple. They will leave us better. And we mean that to, to mean that every student will leave us as a better person, not just a better student, but a better person. And of course, they can't leave us better people if we haven't worked on the non-academic issues as well as the academic issues. And somewhere in that better person, hopefully, is a, a mentally healthy person as well as a physically healthy person and a academically healthy person. Um, so there is certainly a mental health component to when they say they will leave us better. It has forced us to define success differently because we're looking at the whole person. So success in our school is slowly not just becoming, do they graduate? Do they pass their courses? Do they get accepted university college? Do they find a job? Those are all important and they'll always be important, but it can't be the only measure by which we deem that we have done our job and therefore that student will be successful. Uh, all of us who have been through high school can all think of students who did academically well or athletically well, or were you know, a star of the show, they, they had dramatic artistic expertise, but if they didn't have the people skills, if they couldn't deal with conflict, resolve problems, maintain relationships, then they were gonna have a hard time being successful in life. So that's what we've been working on. So we've, we've put forth a concerted effort to strengthen our connection to students, to get to know them better. And just by using the survey itself, I think we're sending a message to our students that we care about what they think, and we want them to feel they belong in our school. We want them to know we care about their well-being, and that we're all about fresh starts, that every day is a new day, and teachers are quite willing and able to forget whatever they may or may not have done the day before, and they're just glad they're here today, and they just wanna work with them in the here and now and uh, not necessarily relive um, old mistakes or, or past misjudgments. And I think because of that, we've seen more students coming forward with all sorts of issues because we're making it very clear that their voice matters, our doors are open, and, and that's both figuratively and literally. Uh, we really try to embody and, and practice what we preach. And uh, about two years ago, we had a, a new school psychiatrist assigned to our school, um, this person has a case of many schools, and ours is one of them. And uh, not knowing our school well at all, uh, one of her first comments uh, when she presented at a staff meeting about kind of her role and what she does, she was surprised for a school of our size how many students we had with mental health issues. And I think that it came across as a negative um, because it doesn't sound good. But when I thought about it more, I took it more as a positive. Um, that to me indicates that our students are comfortable telling us what's happening in their life. They're, they're willing to tell their teacher, their guidance counselor, an EA, an administrator, that they are struggling. And we had a couple of cases of students who would, would not be the typical mental health issues um, in terms of what you think of as a type of student. These are students who are doing fantastically academically and they would seem like they had everything going for them, but they were dealing with huge anxiety issues, depression issues, suicidal tendencies. And I think it's, in fact, I know it's because, um, because of things like the survey, we're sending that message that we want to hear you and we will respond to you. And of course, the survey does that in many ways, but when we ask questions on the survey, like what do you like about our school? What don't you like about our school? And we respond. And sometimes it's something as small as putting more outlets in a hallway because they're bringing their devices to school. But I think it's the message that it sends. Now, speaking of messages, um, the first time we did the survey in 2012, the data clearly showed, amongst other things, that there was a huge disconnect that are from our grade 10 students. Um, most every graph, no matter, no matter the topic, uh, the bar graph showed that our grade 9s, 11s, and 12s all were feeling, let's just say, better about different issues. And our grade 10s were constantly a good drop down from the grade 9s, 11s, and 12s. And once I thought about it, it really was not surprising. Um, we're not a large school. We only have so many uh, guidance counselors available. 
And we had one person who had just a part-time guidance position and they, they looked after grade nines. And then our other guidance counselor had grade 10, 11s and 12s. And given the nature of grade 11s and 12s, um, that individual spent most of her time helping kids transition out of high school. And of course the grade nine counselor spent all her time helping kids transition into high school. But what we were missing was the middle piece. It's like being the middle child. Uh, you can feel ignored. So with some creativity on my end and with being true to the to our approach that if we truly believe that getting to know students is the most important thing, that as the principal, you have to allocate your resources accordingly. Your, your priority should match your resources. So if it's important to you in words, then your actions need to follow through. So with some creativity, we were able to create um, another guidance counselor position without really taking away much from the rest of the school. So now for the last two years, going into now, this is the third year, we have a grade nine counselor, a grade 10 counselor, and a grade 11 and 12 counselor. And again, not surprising, uh, two years ago, the results showed an increase. And last year, pretty much you couldn't tell the difference between one grade or another, um, at least not because of not having a guidance counselor. So what this does in my mind is that this has given our grade tens uh, a better vehicle to have someone to talk to. And we keep the same guidance counselor through those first two grades. So now they've had the same guidance counselor for the first two years of their high school life. And it has resulted in a better connection at the very least with that grade 10 counselor. And I can attribute the creation of that position to the fact that the survey results were demanding that we do something. The first year, again, we when we did the survey, one of our open-ended questions was, uh, what don't you like about our school? We all said, what do you like about our school? And the students were, um, give them credit for the first time doing the survey, they were trying to be very constructive in, in their thinking and in their ideas. So they weren't necessarily just complaining, but they were trying to solve. Many of them commented that our, our five minute breaks that we have between classes, so we have four classes a day, we're a semester school, 75 minute classes times four. Uh, and we have, used to have an hour for lunch with five minute breaks in between. And so the students were saying that five minutes just wasn't enough. It's not because our school is, is big, it is a three story school, but it's, you can get from one classroom to another in about three minutes, but it wasn't leaving them time for the other things. It could be practical things like getting to their locker, going to the bathroom, but it was also just socializing, kind of decompressing as one of the teachers put it, that they would find that the kids would come in and they were still kind of uh, just flying. They really hadn't kind of had a chance to calm down and decompress between one class and another. Uh, and so after talking to the teachers, we agreed that we should try a 10 minute break. Well, again, going into our third year of doing those breaks, um, there's been a lot of intended consequences. Uh, we have hardly any lates, um, you know, with about two minutes to go in the break, eight minutes into the break, the hallways are just about empty. Kids are in the classes. They've been to their lockers, they've got their books, they've been to the bathroom. But from a mental health perspective, more importantly, they've had a chance to socialize. They've had a chance to put school aside, even for two or three minutes, and, and meet up with friends and just connect about social things, which of course, for most teenagers, there, isn't, there can't be any more important than their social life. So they've had a chance to see those people. And maybe if they haven't had a good class, they've been able to touch base with a friend and they talk about something different. And that, that experience from five minutes ago is gone and now they have a new fresh experience and they can go into that classroom feeling better than they were three minutes ago. And I'm not saying that, that we're hoping all the time that classes are a negative experience, but let's face it, not every student loves every class they're in, at least not every day. But we're finding that break gives them a chance to kind of refresh themselves in, in many different ways. And then they're ready to learn when they go into class. And, they, and what the students have told us since then in the surveys is that they feel better. And I think we're hearing that more and more from different, for different reasons, is that the things we're doing are making the students feel better, which again makes me think of mental health. Feeling better has also been a kind of a good byproduct of the next uh, project or initiative that I want to talk about. Um, we've initiated something called catch-up days, and I'll explain more what it is in a second. Uh, but in the first two years of our sur survey results, students, especially our older students, uh, were expressing how their lives become more and more stressful as they go, go through high school. Um, grade 9 and 10, they usually don't have part-time jobs. They are less likely to have a girlfriend, boyfriend. Um, they may be involved in teams. That might be the extent of, of what's added to their life in terms of time. But as they get into grade 11 and 12, um, there's more time stress. It's a job. It's a relationship. It's more teams. It's more clubs. Um, 
if their workload is getting harder, homework is increasing, and you put all that together and they're trying to figure out what to do once they're done high school, um, the stress adds up. And of course, we all see that in our, in our older students. And they weren't exactly sure what we needed to do to help them, but they were clearly saying, we need to do something. How can we, how can we take away some stress? Uh, we still need them to do what they're supposed to do, but how can we do something to give them some, some time where they feel less stressed? So I had done a lot of investigation with different provinces, different systems, and we kind of stole a page out of uh, something the province of Alberta has been working on, and that's, they call it flex time. Well, we just called it catch-up days. Um, so in Alberta, they do more on a regular basis. Once or twice a week, they build into their daily, daily schedule flex time, basically where kids can do what they need to do. So last spring, we tried a, a day in early April, and because it went so well, another day in early June, where we shorten our classes. So our schedule, instead of having four 75-minute classes, we have a 30-minute class to start the day and a 30-minute class right before lunch. But in between there, we've carved out 45 minutes from each class, so 90 minutes in total, where students get to do what they want to do. And, and we mean that literally, um, within reason and safety limits and all that, but it's not, we don't dictate their time. When, when that 30 minute class ends at the end of period one, the bell goes, they have an hour and a half to do what they want to do and go where they want to go. So there are no classes going on for those 90 minutes. Teachers are in their rooms, computer labs are available, libraries available, guidance people are available, special ed teachers are available, administration is available. We are there to serve the students for those 90 minutes. We do the same thing in the afternoon. Start with a 30 minute class, a 90 minute catch up time, and then we end with a 30 minute class. So they have all four of their classes, just have them for much, much shorter period of time. And we were amazed, but honestly not surprised last year when we did it in early April, how well the kids use their time. Um, I think because we've been working on um, student voice, student leadership, um, showing our students through the survey and, and other methods that we want to listen to them, uh, that uh, I, we weren't surprised really that they respected the opportunity they were given. I think they knew that if they made good use of this first attempt, there would be more. And sure enough, there was in June. And in fact, the teachers were so impressed with it that last year we only gave them a 60 minute window. And this year we've upped it to 90. How it connects to mental health, again, very unintended. We did not, we, we knew it would help them, but I don't think we really knew how much it would help the mental health. Even in that very first time we did in early April, I had some senior students come up to me who, who weren't going to be back this year. They, they were in grade 12. They knew they were leaving, but they just said, you know, what, Mr. Friesen, this is a keeper. You have to keep doing this as, as often as you can, because they would say, I feel so much better today. I've got to work tonight. I've got, you know, I have a basketball game tomorrow after school. I have a piano lesson after that. And uh, I just didn't know when I was going to get all this work done, but I just got a whole bunch of work done today and I feel so much better. And I had a lot of students during that day and the next couple of days come up and just give me that very unsolicited um, feedback. I purposely went into classes the next day after we did it the first time and I went into about eight classes. And as soon as I mentioned I was there to talk about catch up day, the kids just lit up. They were they were so happy with it. And I said, okay, I get that you like it, but you gotta tell me why you like it. And they liked it for all the right reasons. They liked it because they appreciated that we were respecting them, that we were giving them an opportunity to, to be adults about their education, to take ownership over their education, that they could do what they wanted to do. But there were so many comments about how they felt better, they felt less stressed, and they really wanted to have more. So this year we're doing it three times each semester. It's not that we couldn't do more, but we're trying to, we're trying to do it slowly to make sure we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, and uh, it's, it, it was a great initiative to start with, and we're hoping that this year will continue to be a great idea. The last uh, facet of our mental health work that connects to our, our survey um, is our leadership program and our grade nine mental health workshops. There's, there's no doubt that the three years we've done the survey, the, um, the, the data that talks about anxiety uh, is, is troublesome, and I'm sure it's the same in every school. But in particular, our survey showed that our grade nine girls were probably the hardest hit population in terms of how they felt about themselves, self-image, self-esteem, and anxiety. We're fortunate here to have a very innovative, very forward-thinking leadership program where um, we base the program on we need to teach leadership skills first. You just can't assume that students come, come naturally by leadership skills. There are people who are natural leaders, but leadership can be taught. 
I don't believe leaders are made 100%. Leadership can be taught. Um, and I myself as someone who I was not a leader in high school, but I think I've learned the skills over the years uh, to be able to do my job as principal. So I, I think I can, I think I know that, that leadership can be taught. So within that program, we really want students to take on leadership projects that matter to them. We want them to be passionate about it. So we don't tell them that we need them to organize a dance. They decide what they want to do. Um, so we had a group of uh, one grade 10 girl, three grade 11 girls who are very committed to mental health because um, three of the four had themselves in grade nine had difficulty with their own mental health, anxiety, depression, and even suicidal tendencies. So they approached their, their two leadership teachers about they wanted to do workshops with grade nine girls because I shared the data with the school and, and they were they were curious and they were troubled by the data just like we were. So their teachers worked with them. Again, they did not work with these grade nine girls from the, the uh, viewpoint of being an expert. They simply were peers that were willing to listen and wanted to hear what was going on in the life of a grade nine girl. So that's what they did. They met with small groups of girls, about six or seven. Uh, they did about 10 groups because we had about 60 grade nine girls last year. And they met with them about every two weeks. And they did that for most of the year. And uh, again, they didn't, they didn't try to become the mental health expert. They didn't try to be the practitioner. They simply listened. And they passed on to their teachers and they passed on to the guidance folks and they passed on to us as a staff. Um, that the stuff they heard was, was hard to hear sometimes. But again, from our perspective, we're glad that the girls are talking about it. And our grade nine girls had the chance to share and to feel that, that they weren't the only one feeling that way, which is sometimes where um, students with mental health issues uh, can make some unfortunate choices where they feel they're alone. And if we accomplish nothing else, we now have a group of grade 10 girls who know that they're not alone that they know that there are other people struggling. And one of the girls at her leadership program last year, she's gonna do a follow-up with those grade 10 girls this year um, to see kind of how they're doing and are they doing better and did their conversations have any impact. So that that's the uh, last of the components of what we've been doing at WCI that I think uh, shows a connection between uh, using our, our the Tell Them For Me survey and how it's had a, an impact on our mental health. For those out there that have used a survey or are going to use a survey or thinking about doing it, the, the one thing I can honestly say is that I had no idea how it would help us in areas that I didn't think about initially. And I can certainly say mental health was one of them. As I said, we, we, we used the survey because we wanted a, a tangible measure to see how we were doing to get to know students better. But it has spawn, it has spun into many other areas, including and certainly very importantly, mental health. And I think we have a healthier school because of what we're trying to do. And the surveys played an important role to give us that annual measure and a reason to go deeper and a reason to dive further into some areas that I don't think we would have had a good handle on if we hadn't been using the survey. So thank you for listening. I hope you found this information to be helpful and uh, enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much, Chris. Now, before we conclude today, I'd like to share with you some websites that might be of interest. Thank you all for your time today, and we hope you enjoyed this webinar focused on mental health. From all of us, best wishes for a successful start to the school year. May all of your student voices be heard such that, as Chris Friesen says, they will leave us better. We look forward to working with you in the 2014-2015 school year. Thank you.